I come from a very intellectual, very academic family. Both my grandfathers were among the greatest scholars of the 20th century, and my father is a very fine scholar of Buddhism and classical Indian languages. It's fair to say that growing up, I'm not sure I quite appreciated this milieu I was in. I was a pretty regular kid, very into football, then rock music. But there's no doubt that around our house, the conversation was of a very rich intellectual sort. History, politics, music, science, culture, were all an integral part of our everyday lives. I remember on one occasion we were sitting around our family table and we were eating this delicious hazelnut cake my grandmother used to make, made with just eggs, by the way, no flour, very interesting. And there's also whipped cream that went with the cake. And we started discussing whether this cream went from being a liquid to some kind of solid because of a chemical reaction that happened when you whipped it or some kind of mechanical change in the cream. At the table was also a friend of mine, a French-Canadian philosophy teacher. And at one point, he just banged down his spoon and said, my God, I just want to enjoy the cake and the cream. <laughs> we looked a little bit sheepishly at one another and then at our plates. And I think that was a moment of realization that our family was a little bit unusual. <laughs> I don't think he was right about us over-intellectualizing all food, because chocolate was also a major part of our family life. But he was certainly right that this milieu, this culture of rich intellectual conversation was very much part of our normal family life. One of my grandfathers, Ernst Gombrich, is credited with revitalizing art history in the English-speaking world. He brought into art history a knowledge and love of psychology, biology, and also non-science disciplines like history, philosophy, classics, and so on. He was really a very great interdisciplinarian. He wouldn't have liked that word, because it's a very ugly word, but it's true. He didn't see any boundaries in knowledge. On the contrary, he thought that to address the most interesting problems, you needed to access and use and leverage knowledge from any discipline at all. One of my grandfather's great friends was Karl Popper, the philosopher, another great 20th century intellectual. And Karl Popper said, we are not students of some subject matter. We are students of problems. And problems cut right across the borders of any subject matter or discipline. Popper believed that it was deeply human to be a problem solver. He thought that was one of humanity's defining traits. And he said, there's nothing greater in life than to find your problem, to fall in love with it, and to spend your life trying to solve it at Cambridge, at many, many other universities around the world, have this incredible opportunity. We're immensely privileged that we're in a position to be able to find our problem and then spend some or even all of our lives addressing finding a solution to that problem. I want to tell you now about three students on the course I run at UCL, the Arts and Sciences BASC. Rosita is studying inorganic chemistry, material science proper chemistry with the chemists. She's also very artistic. She did an art foundation course, and she's studying fine art with us as well. And she's done some design engineering. She uses software to design and prototype products. Rosita's capstone dissertation is looking at how she might design a face mask for very polluted cities like London or Delhi or Shanghai. And isn't it a lovely thought that some young, aesthetically minded, Material scientists with strong design engineering knowledge would design a beautiful face mask for us to enjoy in any smoggy environment. Chemistry, art, and engineering. Very few courses at university level would allow someone like Rosita to bring together those particular disciplines in that very interesting way to solve that particular problem. Lena graduated last year, and her capstone dissertation was on anaerobic digestion basically putting food waste in a kind of low-tech box, which turns out heat, which can then be used to heat the building which the waste came from. It's kind of part of the circular economy. Lena used some knowledge of engineering with economics and sociology, and she previously studied law, to produce an outstanding capstone dissertation, which won the World Undergraduate Awards for Environmental Science last year. 
Virginia studied international development, systems engineering, languages, and she also taught herself, because you should all do that while at university, some coding on the side, and she got quite proficient in coding. Virginia now heads up a tech part, a startup part, of an international consultancy firm looking at conflict and fragile states, bringing to bear all her interdisciplinary knowledge in that particular real-world environment. International development, systems engineering, languages, coding. These students couldn't really have solved these problems without some kind of interdisciplinary package, some synthesis of knowledge. So one would hope, really, that universities would naturally provide such courses, such environments for people to do such wonderful curricula of their own interest. People who can fall in love with that problem that Popper says we should and then bring to bear the extraordinary wealth of knowledge that they can on those problems. One would hope that would happen anyway. But there's more, of course. We are living in the most extraordinary times for our interaction with knowledge and the generation of knowledge. I have friends my age who crossed continents to go to a university because the library in the university was so good. Now, I'm not saying there still aren't hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of very beautiful old books and manuscripts which are in libraries and which we do need to go to interact with. But let's be honest, most students don't really think about the quality of the book library now when they go to university, for very good reason. On their phone, in the palm of their hand, they are accessing the millions and millions of bits of information and knowledge that come down to them. And where are the categories of knowledge on this phone? Where are the boundaries between history and sociology? Or, for that matter, between art and engineering? Or engineering and material science? Or law, sociology, economics and engineering? Where are those boundaries? We know that most innovation comes from nearby examples. It's what's called recombinant innovation. Most innovation happens when people see one idea, juxtapose it with another, and synthesize something new out of it. And yet we don't really encourage intellectual environments for younger people where they can move between these different disciplines and see the possibilities to synthesize these things together. Stephen Berlin Johnson, the writer on innovation, says chance favors the connected mind. And yet you can't really connect the dots unless you've had experience of different disciplines and some idea of how to bring those disciplines together. So we need to provide educational infrastructures, educational cultures, which allow our young people this possibility to fall in love with their problem and bring to bear on that problem the whole wealth of knowledge now at their disposal through which they wander. I call this period a period in which the combinatorial space of ideas has exploded. You're in it right now. You walk through it. Wherever you walk, you're in that combinatorial space of ideas. And what an explosion it is. You need an environment, an educational culture, and educational infrastructures that allow you to leverage that explosion and synthesize new knowledge from this amazing sweet shop of knowledge we're living in. So what we must do, I think, is stand on the shoulders of our disciplinary grandfathers and grandmothers with their art history and their wonderful hazelnut cake. But we must also create new educational infrastructures, new educational cultures, which allow for this exciting, synthetic, interdisciplinary learning, so important for now and for the years to come.